everybody. You're watching the Mike Nelson Show. I want to thank everybody who's uh, subscribed to the channel. Today, I got a very special guest. I got legendary singer Graham Bonnet. How are you doing today, Graham? Hi there. How are you? Well, today's a Friday. It's the first uh, Friday of uh, February. Hopefully, uh, everybody has a great month out there. How's your week been going, Graham? Uh, well, okay, so far. You know, I'm uh, looking forward to getting on the road again and getting out there playing, which uh, doesn't look until uh, a couple of months away. We're going to Japan, and uh, that'll probably be our first getting on the road gigs, it will be then probably. But you never know, something could happen where we find more uh, work, but a lot of people are off their own now because of uh, the lack of interest in, uh, and the COVID thing, let me just say that. It's all over the damn world and uh, in Japan especially, but we have some J Japanese gigs coming up. But um, meantime, I'm uh, writing songs for the next album, the next uh, band album, GB band. So that's uh, another thing I'm doing. And also I'm writing with Jeff Loomis for another album, which should be totally separate from what I'm doing with my band. So I've written songs, six songs with Jeff Loomis already. And uh, it's just a matter of uh, getting a deal for that, actually. That's what we're doing. <laughs> we've got to do like a, a demo uh, track so we can play it to somebody. Or, you know, the usual thing. What do you think? Uh, Jeff is a great guitar player, and uh, I'm very proud to work with him, you know. Right, so the first question I usually ask all the guests is, so when did you start singing, Graham? When did your musical journey begin? When did I begin? Oh, when yeah, I was when about start seven singing? years old, I think. So, so, no, may, maybe less. Maybe when I was about five. I um, was uh, always listening to the radio, and I would listen to uh, Mario Lanza, who was an opera singer, and I would sing his songs in the house, and my mom and dad were very amused by that. This little boy walking around... You know, doing the full, you know, <laughs> and they were amused by it. So I thought, Mom and Dad love it, so I'll keep doing it. That's when I kind of started. Then later on, I I was in the the Boy Scouts and I did concerts with them. I did concerts at school, um, playing guitar and singing. Uh, it's been a long journey. I've done so many things, being in talent shows, etc., uh, etc., et to see if I could, uh, you know, have a career in this. I never thought I would. I really thought that. It was a magical thing that happened to other people. But, um, you know, in 1968, uh, we were playing in a club, uh, my cousin and I and our band, Trevor Gordon is my cousin. Trevor was um, my partner in it, what came to be. Um, we were out uh, playing in a club called the Revolution Club in London. And out of the audience came this guy who was uh, Australian and said to my cousin Trevor, who had lived in Australia, um, you know that uh, the Gibb brothers would like to see you again. Good. Cousin Trevor was in the Bee Gees when he, he lived in Australia. I'm not telling the story. I'm telling the story back to front. But he moved to England um, when uh, I asked him to come over to be in my band. And we moved to London. And that's when this thing happened. So he had uh, Barry Gibb's telephone number, went to his house, and uh, I... He came back home and said, um, well, I've been to the, they're interested in recording me, Graham, but I've told them that you sing also. And so I went along to meet the Bee Gees later and we sat around playing guitars, singing Stevie Wonder songs and Beach Boys and Beatles and whatever you like. And uh, that's where the recording part of my uh, career started, really. So Barry Gibb wrote a tune for my cousin and I uh, in 1968 and it went to number three in the British charts, but it was never released in America. Uh, all over the world it was released, but, but America. I don't know why, but anyway, it wasn't. And it was a good record. We did really great. And um, we had two singles. We were called The Marbles. <laughs> Terrible name. We were called The Marbles. <laughs> we had two singles that were written by Barry Gibb, and they both did very well. The first one was called Only One Woman. And uh, we still do that uh, now, to this day. It's like a, a soulful song, you know, it's kind of an R&B song. So, yeah. um, you know, it's been a, a long journey. That's really when my career sort of started, you know, 60, 1968. So after the Marbles, did you, did you for, for a few years, you were working on, on different things, like like commercials, they call them jingles. Is that what you were doing in the 70s? Yeah, oh, you know what? You know what happened to me, don't you? <laughs> You've got the history there. Uh, yes, I did some commercials for uh, Ritz crackers, uh, ski yogurts, um, and other things, I can't remember exactly what, but uh, that was a terrible time. I was really down because that's all I was doing. 
And uh, what they paid very well. I did a, 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 a commercial for Levi Jeans, and that paid really well. Uh, so it was, um, I didn't know what to do with my career. I was managed by different people. They didn't know what to do with me. They said, he's a, a diamond in the rough. What can we do? Because I was a solo singer. And uh, I was suddenly, after uh, a while, I was offered uh, gigs by bands were calling me. And I didn't want to be in the band. I wanted to be a solo singer. So um, Jeff Lynn got in touch with me um, to be in this band called uh, Electric Life Orchestra. And believe it or not, I turned that down. <laughs> wow. uh, to this day, I don't know why. <laughs> But um, well, you I regret do doing that. that. Hey, you regret turning that down? Uh, yeah, I mean, why would I do that? I went along <laughs> to the Philips studio uh, where he was there. Jeff Lynn was there with uh, Roy Wood, who was another partner uh, with him, and uh, they played me these tracks and all this orchestral stuff going on. I went, shit, that's really amazing, you know. And Jeff was really into it, and uh, he said, "Well, we want you to sing, lead, and play bass." And uh, I said. Well, I'm not sure if I can play bass and sing. This is one of the stories I, I, I wind. I, I, this is one thing that happened. I can't play bass and sing, but I can play a guitar and sing. He said, well, we don't need a guitar player. We've got 2,000 in this band, you know. So we want, Roy was going to play cello, I think. And he wanted to put the guitar down. It wanted me to play bass and sing. And I said, well, I don't think I can do that. I think I'll start singing the bass line. Because they'd heard... I, I was a session bass player, which I was for a time. But, I, but singing with the bass, it's kind of like playing drums. You know, like, how the hell? You know, when people play drums and sing, I don't get that either. It's, um, so I turned it down. And um, I remember Roy Wood saying, who are you, Paul McCartney? You know, <laughs> so, so that was that for me. And um, I, I sort of am kicking myself now because I didn't do it. but. Later on, I found out from one of the guys in at ELO, he said, you wouldn't have got your, your mouth from singing in there because Jeff wants to do everything, which he did. You know, he's, he's incredible, great musician. So I was kind of lucky not to be in that um, kind of situation where I would be singing a little bit and not very much. So that was that. And then Uriah, he called me up. Um, uh, Steeler's Wheel, which was another band. Um, a a tough few bands called me to see what I was doing. And I turned them all down because I didn't want, at that time, didn't want to be in a band. I wanted to carry on being a solo singer, you know, which is really ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was really hard, you know, to be a solo singer. It still is today, you know. So let's fast forward to 1977. That was your uh, first uh, solo album then, 77? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. How did you get a deal done for a solo album? I didn't get it. Well, uh, I, that's, I had management, which is a good thing to have, because I didn't have management for years. I didn't want somebody to be take it, taking money from me when I was doing the work, if you know what I mean. Um, so my manager got in touch with, um, uh, with, with Rainbow, in fact, with those guys. Are you talking about that time? Yeah, 77, like before the solo album. Oh, that was, yeah. So yeah. Those, those records were made with really, really good musicians because I was still following my uh, solo career. Um, I was very lucky to have people working on those albums like, you know, John Lord and Mickey Moody and et cetera, et cetera. Um, those were good times, really good times. And from, from that, um, I think uh, I got uh, Rainbow, the Rainbow Connection, so to speak. <laughs> I heard a song on one of my albums called Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? And uh, he sort of said, where is this guy now? Because I was still solo, you know. And uh, uh, Roger Glover said, well, I know where he is because I'm working with Mickey Moody in England. And uh, Mickey Moody and I were managed, the guitar player, Mickey Moody, were managed by the same management. And so Roger called up and said, would you come over to audition with this band, Rainbow? Uh, and I thought, well, Maybe, but I've just turned down other bands in, in the past because I really wanted to be solo and that was it, you know. Uh, so I went over to, uh, it was uh, Switzerland, on the border of Switzerland, France, where Rainbow was recording. And uh, I had a, a, an audition piece, which was a song called Mistreated. 
So I had to listen to Rainbow albums and find out who they were because I had no idea. I learned this one song and I went over there and uh, I was really nervous because I was going, oh, Jesus Christ. Because I heard them rehearsing. It's like, this is amazing. You know, I thought, I don't fit in this, you know. So I'm there. There's the microphone. So <laughs> the mistreated song, I didn't sing on the microphone. I, I just sang it. They started playing and I sang it without the mic. And after we'd finished this song, they all looked at me and went, well, <laughs> we, we can hear you <laughs> without the microphone. And uh, yeah. so we, we did it again without the microphone because I was frightened of screwing up. You know, the, you know, something happened to my voice. While was, <laughs> and they would hear it because it would be amplified, you know. So that's why I did it off mic. No other reason. No other reason. But they said, we can hear you. I said, well, I know I've got a loud voice, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Don Airy said to me, uh, Graham, can you sit on mic this time? And I did another take on mic, and I got the job that day. But uh, I wasn't sure I fit in the band. So I went home to London uh, and said to my manager, I don't think I'm right for this. I don't think I can. I don't understand the music for, for a start. It's not like I've been doing, because I was doing like R&B, pop kind of music. I don't understand what, what happens with this music. What where do I where do I come in in this huge, you know, orchestration kind of thing? Where, where do I sing? And he said, Well, just look, listen, go back <laughs> and start again. And you can do this. He says, Graham, it'll be a great move for you to do this. And what well, it was eventually I found out. But uh, so I went back to uh, rehearse with them, and uh, Roger Glover guided me through every track. So we started recording. The album, which became uh, uh, an album called Down to Earth. And uh, we went through every damn song. He wrote the words and I wrote the melodies. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize I was doing that. Roger would give me a rough idea of uh, how the melody should go. And he said, now take it your way. And so all the tracks were, well, Roger wrote the, the words without fail. And then I made up the, the melodies. And I didn't realize I was a songwriter. I thought, what the hell? Later on, somebody said to me, well, you wrote that song, did you? No, but you sang the melody, right? I said, yeah. Then well, you were a songwriter then. And I said, shit. I, I was really green, you know? So, so <laughs> that, that was my songwriting days. It started there, really. But um, Roger guided me through every song. And we did each song on that album four different ways. We had four different sets wow. of lyrics, four different melodies. And uh, so we did it like that because Richie would come in, Richie Blackmore would come in and go, uh, no, not that one, that one, oh, that one, you know. So he would choose which melody to use, you know. And it was a long process. And I, I really enjoyed it. But God, it was tiresome, you know, because I was a little boy lost a little bit, but I learned what um, Rainbow was all about and that kind of music. And I thank Roger Glover very much for that. And, all the guys in the band, really, you know, and Richie, because we became good friends and everything was explained to me. And, uh, it, you know, I'd never done this kind of music before. But then suddenly I was a heavy singer or a heavy, heavy rock singer, which I didn't understand because I'm still singing the same way as I did in the past. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but, you know, it's the same yeah. voice, yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I suddenly was this singer that uh, was in this band and we, had a hit record with Sinchimin Go. Let's uh, fast forward a little bit back or rewind a little bit back a couple of years before um, you joined Rainbow. Did you see yourself part of the, the disco scene that was going on? You you, uh, you even did a song that wasn't used for the Saturday Night uh, Fever oh, soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that correct on your solo? Yeah. So you saw yourself as part of that disco scene? Yeah, that was because of the Bee Gees. You know, the Bee Gees wrote all the music for Saturday Night Live, uh, Saturday Night Fever or whatever it was. And um, they had this song called Warm Ride that Robin Gibb wrote. And I got the demo of that. And my manager said, uh, yeah, this is when I was solo. And my manager said, you got to do that. I said, well, it's, it's disco. It's horrible, you know. But I did the thing. <laughs> and it was a number one hit re record in Australia, along with the album I did at the same time. Uh, so it was never released here uh, or England, I don't think, either. It was really an Australian uh, Kind of music, I guess, and because it wasn't in uh, uh, in the movie, it's uh, it became well known. I and mean, we do it that song now, you know, on stage. It's uh, something that uh, I'm quite proud of. But disco, I thought no, 
No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it works out okay. It might have that funny beat and the, you know, dance rhythm, but it was okay. I had fun singing it and, you know, it's music. Yeah. So let's uh, fast forward a little bit to, uh, you know, talking about Rainbow. You replaced a legendary singer, you know, Ronnie James Dio. How was it like, you know, the fan reception, you know, playing live? How was that like, you know, replacing Ronnie Dio? Yeah. Well, I didn't know Ronnie for, well, until later. I didn't know why well, I heard him on the albums because I had to listen to the early albums to learn this mistreated song and also some other stuff. And I just thought, well, I'm not that kind of singer. You know, I'm not. But when, um, when I did what I did with Rainbow, I was really proud of that. And they were very happy with me. So I, I didn't um, feel sort of, um, uh, you know, nervous about replacing him at all because we're just not the same. But he's a great singer. And uh, I thought, well, I don't, that's one of the reasons I thought I wasn't right for the band. I thought it was a, a different kind of singer, you know. And um, But to replace him was kind of difficult because of the audience. You know, they'd be doing, Ronnie, Ronnie. you know, when I first went on stage, because I'm wearing like a, a white sports coat and some black pants, <laughs> some black pants, you know, looking like Elvis. <laughs> and uh, going, out, going out there, they're going, Ronnie. So th then that was when I found out it was difficult to replace uh, a great guy and a great singer. So I went out there um, <laughs> and they go, Ronnie, Ronnie. And so I had to sort of look at them and say, I hope this will impress you, my voice, you know. And one night, there's some guys down there in the front row giving me the finger, going, oh, you fucking, <laughs> you fucking faggot, you know, all this, you know. And uh, we used to do a song called Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow uh, sometimes, which is an old uh, song that Richie loved and he liked playing it. And uh, Richie just <laughs> was playing, it started with the chords, and we go, oh, wow, okay. And, you know, tonight you're mine completely, it was the first line. So what I did was go sit in front of these guys on the edge of the stage, these guys that were giving me the finger. Tonight you're mine, you know, and saying right at them. And they started laughing, and I said, thanks. <laughs> and after that, they were all happy, and, you know. <laughs> so I made some friends, and after about... Uh, Two gigs, I was, you know, accepted by the audiences. It was uh, a surprise to me in a way because of where I looked and um, the way I sang, I guess, you know. Was it hard working with Richie? Yeah, was yeah. it hard working with R Richie? Richie. Yeah, well, yeah. I tell you, he be, as I said before, he, he became my best friend musically, you know. And uh, before uh, shows... Uh, I'd always go to Richie's dressing room. This is when we had dressing rooms of our own. Hey, <laughs> separate dressing room. What the hell's that? Get changed in the toilet. No, I can't do that. Uh, you know, it's all the bathroom. Uh, outside, we don't have dressing rooms. So anyway, we have our own dressing rooms. And every every night, uh, Richie would call me in. And uh, he said, well, what can we do tonight? We'll, we'll be funny. You know, some we'd play a gag on one of the guys in the band or something. And he said, well, let's get, where's the uh, the Jack Daniels? And the, the Jack Daniels will come out. And he said, I've made a line. We drink it up to there. And he said, then you should be just right. And we did that every <laughs> night. We didn't get drunk. We just had that nice, relaxed feeling. So every night he would do that. And I got it on with him so well. People were going, you know, how do you get on with him? He's, you know, he's, he's horrible. He's a moody. No, he's not moody. He's a very shy person and chooses his friends. That's all. You know, he doesn't like signing autographs. Uh, nobody does when you're trying to get, you know, oh, I want to go home, you know. But um, he was a, a, what, an inspiration to me. He led the way and he got me really into the, the, the music of Rainbow. It was fantastic. You know, him and Roger Glover, uh, well, all the band, Cozy, of course, Cozy Powell and Don Airy, the whole band. And uh, it was just, um, it was a treat to learn something new from a guy that had been playing this music for years and that was teaching me what it was all about, you know? And uh, I tried my best to be that person that he wanted singing in the band. And I think he was happy, you know, I was. Now you only recorded one album with Rainbow. Did you did you leave the band after that album and tour? Yeah, yeah. Um, we were uh, rehearsing to do another album, which is the one that Joe Lynn Turner did. And we didn't have any songs and we were up in the rehearsal room and nobody was turning up. There'd be like me there and Don Airy one day or 
me, Roger Glover and Don Airy, but not the whole band. We had a new drummer. Uh, he, he was always there, always there, but there was no Richie Blackmore. So I'm wow. going to Don, I said, what, what the fuck is that? What's happening? <laughs> I said, is this band coming to a fucking shitty ending? It felt like the band was over, you know, to me. And I said to Don, well, what, what are we going to do? Well, we've got one song by Russ Ballard, it's called I Surrender. And uh, Roger said to me, uh, shall we go in and do that? I said, yeah, that's all we have. So I went in and I did some backing vocals for I Surrender, which uh, Joe did later. And um, I said, well, okay, now what? Now what? Now what happens? He said, well, we'll do the lead later, you know, the lead part. And I'm sitting there at rehearsals with nobody there and no, no, no music being written. And I said, well, I'm going to go back to Los Angeles. So I went back home and uh, they, I got a call from Bruce Payne, the manager of uh, Rainbow. He said, are you going to come back, Graham? We, we need you to come back to do, do vocals. I said, well, nothing's happening. He said, well, what about if we write some songs, we write, the band writes some songs, you come and we get another singer to do that and you can sing the songs that you like uh, when you've written something or other. It was like two singers in now. And that doesn't work for me. So I didn't go back. And um, that was it. You know, I I wasn't fired. I I resigned, you know, and I, I shouldn't have. I wish I'd just stayed a bit longer. But they wanted to, uh, to do the, get this album done, so to get, get hold of uh, Joe Lynn. And, um, you know, he did a great job on the album. He did I Surrender, which he, he replaced the backing vocals, I think. But that's all I did on that album. But um, anyway, he did a great job and they uh, had some hit records, whatever. And um, I uh, was very happy that I wasn't in it anymore. I was going to start something new. So let's uh, fast forward to 1982. You played on Assault Attack with Michael Schechter group. How was it like playing with uh, Michael Schechter, you know, recording the oh, album? Yeah, my, uh, that was <laughs> that was fun too. Uh, probably a bit too drunk and fun. But we had lots of drink every day. But uh, at one point, uh, I had to stop because I was getting so drunk I was falling over. But uh, some mornings, uh, I mean, looking back at that, some mornings me and Michael will have like a, some champagne as soon as we got up, champagne and oh, we're getting ready now, and whatever else Michael took, I don't know. But oh, we're ready to go now. So we get down and, you know, start recording. And uh, Martin Birch, who was the producer of that record that I did with him, uh, used to say to me, uh, Graham, have you been drinking? He could tell by my voice if I'd had some drink. He said, no, your voice isn't clear. It's all, you know. And say, just piss off, will you? I'm going to get Michael in. So he'd get Michael in, who was never recorded in the daytime, which I like doing, and uh, would uh, come and do stuff with Michael or uh, bass parts, you know. So um, it was... <laughs> it was fun, and uh, at the same time, I really messed up by the first gig we did. I was not good. <laughs> I did some horrible things on stage, which I, again, it was too much booze and too much fuck you kind of attitude um, to everybody. And I go on stage and expose myself a little bit. <laughs> And not not sing the song. All, all the songs were written out for me on stage, behind every uh, monitor. All these songs were written out because I didn't know some of them. The new songs then was the old songs from the old albums, and um, the audience pushed forward, and all my uh, sheets were all wrinkled up. They were ah oh, fucking you know, so I couldn't read the lyrics. So I go yeah fuck it, but you know whatever I did, <laughs> but I wasn't very nice in many ways, in many ways. And um, so I just ran off stage and uh, I got out of there and the uh, one of our uh, crew said, you better get home to the hotel, back to the hotel. He said, they're gonna fucking kill you. So I went back to the hotel and next morning I went back to London and we had a, a big concert coming up uh, that was gonna be headlining. And uh, I said to uh, the guys, I said to my manager, I said, I can do it. He says, no good, Graham. You're sober now, but uh, they're not going to trust you. So they fired you. You know, so I was fired. Well, obviously, I was a wreck, an absolute wreck. And uh, not particularly uh, clear. I mean, hanging my penis out, for one thing. You know, there's, there's, you know, and whipping it around. I mean, it was so 
I don't know, it's surreal to think about it now because I can't really remember it that well, but it's there in my head somewhere. It was, uh, you know, it's in a foggy, foggy mist, <laughs> like I was on the night. So, I mean, I, but I, won't, I would have been able to do it because I would have been sober. We had like a day off, but I'll make sure I've been sober. But I've been drinking, you know, all day uh, when that's happened with uh, the guys from Whitesnake, who I haven't seen for years. And, oh dear, I'm not blaming it on them. It's all my fault. But what a time. The album, the album turned out bloody great, I think. And uh, I've been working with Michael recently and uh, sober <laughs> and uh, playing with him and uh, we've had a good time. It's really good to do some of those old songs together with uh, Robin McCauley and uh, uh, everybody, you know, Gary Barden, you know, the old singers. It's, um, we did a whole show together and uh, it, I, I loved it. And when, when I sang the first song of um, the first day we did the concerts, I looked over at Michael and he was smiling and yeah, you did it with that fucking up. <laughs> one of those smiles. You know, that, yeah, we made it this time. I'm singing properly and uh, not being an arsehole, you know, or an asshole. <laughs> so it's really good. So oh. everything's uh, mended with me, Michael. You know, everything's really good. And uh, he's my friend again. And uh, what a great player. I just love him. So do you think you're you're lucky to be alive after all the you know the crazy times in the early 80s or late 70s of heavy drinking? Do you think you think you're lucky to be here? Yeah, yeah, I do. But I I in a way I, I wasn't that hard a drinker. I mean I was, but I wasn't. And other people were taking stuff that I never took, like you know, doing blow and all that kind of shit. I, I couldn't do that. All I did was drink beer constantly. And uh, it was like noon till bedtime, you know you know, sort of thing. Uh, it was the only way I could enjoy the day. Um, and uh, in, I'm in AA now, you know, but then I got out of that uh, band and I was sober for 15 years, you know, so I did pretty well, you know, but um, it was a, a hazy time. And uh, I look back at that and the horrible hangovers and think, I don't want that again, you know. So when I'm at meetings in AA, I hear people tell similar stories to the my, you know, to mine. It's uh, you know it's horrible. I was killing myself with poison, and um, a lot of my friends I think won't be around for very long who are drinking heavy. You know, people I know right now they're getting uh, their brains are getting fried, and they're also getting overweight and whatever else. They look unhealthy. So I'm worried about a few of my friends. We we're still drinking after all these years, but uh, I said, as I said, I had 15 years of soberness, which was um, a great thing, you know. But then I made a mistake of drinking again at one time. <laughs> but I'm I'm sober now. Sober. You know? Believe it or not, I don't sound like I am, do I? I'm hardly awake. That's what it is. No, no. <laughs> anyway, yes, I've just had a bath. I'm just, <laughs> just got out of the bath. And, uh, I'm babbling a bit, I think. But anyway, I'm here. <laughs> so talking about wh why do you think so many uh you know musicians rock stars or you know musicians in any genre why do you think they they fall so easily into drugs and alcohol you know you know it's been going on for decades we, we see people dying young even today yeah. why, why do you think that happens well because because the, the lifestyle is unnatural you have to travel a lot a lot of traveling and that wears you out just to you know then from A to B. And then it's supposed to perform and be, you know, all lively and ruby and fabulous. <laughs> and uh, the only way you can do that, well, for a lot of people and for me, it was having a drink to feel relaxed and get excited. You know, that fake uh, buzz you get for, you know, I'm here, I'm strong now, woo, you know, I'm gonna kill tonight. Uh, that's what it's all about. And it's always like now when we play but backstage, there's all the, the liquor lined up, which I don't touch. I drink uh, bubbly water now, which I'm doing now. And um, that's my that's my thing. I've been drinking that forever. Um, it's there. I remember when um, I go back, you know, years back to uh, Judy Garland and uh, Mickey Rooney. When they made their movies, they would give them uppers in the daytime because we're kids. Uppers in the daytime and downers for nighttime. And that's kind of like what this is. 
or what it was, you know, you go, take some uppers, do a you know, couple of blues or whatever, and some beers, and then take uh, quaaludes to help you sleep. That's kind of like it was. So you got another buzz to sleep. So it's an unnatural life, you know. I'm not, I'm not really that guy that stands on stage. None of us are. We're playing a part, you know. But that part sometimes isn't there. <laughs> you think, oh crap, really? <laughs> After like you know, two thousand hours on the plane and then twelve hours in the van, and, oh god, you know, the traveling gets you down. So I, obviously, it's a pick me up, but uh, not a good. Let's one. go back to uh, to uh, Alcatraz, the band you were in. No parole, no parole from rock and roll. Talk to me about that album. Sorry, what was it? The, the, the first album you recorded with Alcatraz, a uh, no parole from rock and roll. Tell tell me about that album. Oh, that was um, yeah. Uh, this is when I had no manager at all, and found a manager who said to me, uh, "It was he managed uh, Jethro Tull and a few other people." Um, he said to me, um, "You've got to start writing songs and get a band together." So um, I didn't have a band. So I found. He said, Let, "Let's look in uh, a music magazine for some players." We want some players that are uh, sort of well known, so going to make it like a so-called super group ish. And um, he found two guys in uh, some music magazine, a bass player and a keyboard player. I said, okay. They came to my house. We started uh, playing, tr trying to write some songs. And I said to my manager, well, they're okay, but they're not good enough. He said, well, look, they've had a hit record with this song out there, you know. And he said. Um, They've had a hit song. People know who they are, these two guys. And I said, but, but they're not good enough for this kind of music, um, which is, that sounds a bit silly me saying that because I wasn't good enough for Rainbow, I thought. And anyway, the, these guys weren't good enough. I was hoping to get somebody like Keith Emerson or, uh, you know, Don Airy and, you know, whatever, some great bass player. And that, that's what I didn't get. And he, he said, well, the record company wants you to do something now, otherwise you lose the deal. Oh, fuck. So then we had to find a drummer and a, a guitar player. We went through a million guitar players. We rehearsed, I didn't even go to some of these rehearsals. There were so many, I thought, well, okay, the band will take it for a bit, because I don't need to be there, you know, auditioning guitar players. We went through, I don't know how, 10, 15 guitar players, and they were never, never quite right. Uh, all sort of well-known people. And um, we then heard about this guy called Ingbe Malmsteen, who was 19, I think 19 at the time, uh, from somebody in a, in a store. He said, I, I know what Graham is looking for. He's looking for something that sounds like Rainbow. So this guy is Richard Blackmore, part two, but uh, Swedish. <laughs> so, so we invited him along to a, an audition and I asked him to play I got on the phone and I asked him to play something that wasn't hard rock. I asked him to play one of my songs off one of my albums. Uh, and uh, it was called SOS, which uh, Russ Ballard wrote. Because I wanted to hear what he played like without going, you know, all that. And he was amazing. He played like you wouldn't. I was just blown away. I mean, he's still great. I mean, English is still great. He's an amazing player. But now there's so many people out there who are playing the same way. You know, little, little kids of seven are going, blah, 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 you know, tapping and you're going, how the hell is that little seven-year-old girl playing like that? But that's what they hear and that's what they learn. And that's not like when I was a kid. It was, you know, instrumental guitar players, but you know, Apache, you know what I mean? That was yeah. <laughs> what I heard. And Dwayne, they you know, all very straightforward stuff. And um, anyway, he just got, we just went, oh my God. And of course, when we played live, people just couldn't stop looking at him. Because you, you, know, you see what this is doing and it's amazing. He was uh, just incredible. And then we found um, Jan Uvina, our drummer, he'd been with uh, Alice Cooper. So we found another sort of famous guy. So we got some guy who was well known within uh, the music business. And that was it. The band was put together, but it wasn't quite how I wanted it. Or we, you know, but it was put together, and we made the album, uh, which was all my songwriting with Ingve, uh, and it's um, 
worked out well, but I wasn't keen on the production, but, uh, you know, it was all done. I think it was done too hurriedly, but the playing on there is amazing, you know, and I hear people in other bands, you know, copy bands, whatever, playing Alcatraz music and that great guitar playing, they copied down to the T. And Ingve um, made the band, he really did. And I was just like blown away by him. I love singing with him up front. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, this is really, really good. And of course he still is, he's out there playing still. You know, but uh, it was a hard time, you know, finding the right band. I wanted to change it, but we had to get on with the work, you know, otherwise we'd have lost the deal. <laughs> now, Ingve left after a couple albums. Uh, what happened there? Oh, God. <laughs> well, what, what happened was um, we, were on, we were playing. Well, we did, he was getting a bit, he, he changed a lot. He wasn't that shy kid who was happy to be in this band. He was suddenly becoming, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And what he was doing was, say I'm singing, he would stand in front of me and start under like a verse of a song, which didn't fit. You're playing the chords there. You know, you know, widdly widdling there, you know. He started to do that. It's, it's a little bit taller than me, but that much of me. And he had Cuban heel shoes. And I, I'm going, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? And I was saying, what are you doing, Ingve, after the game was over, what, what, what are you doing? I'm just doing my thing, man, you know. But too much, you know. People are looking at you. No need to come stand in front of me, you know. So this went on for a little while. He was like wiggly wiggling through every damn song. And um, one night, we, his guitar solo came up, where everybody leaves the stage. Well, me anyway. And I was on the way. I was going to go back to the bus. And I tripped over his lead to his guitar and pulled it out of the amp. And so he thought I'd done it on purpose. And I was at the bus with the, the bus driver talking to him. And Ingve comes out and gets me by the throat and starts strangling me like this, pushing on my tonsils and trying to kill me, basically. Uh, he wanted to ruin my voice, and uh, along with the hatred of what I had done. So you fucking can't. I said, no, what? What did I do? I didn't realize I'd done it. You know, I would never do that to him, even though he was getting a bit uppity, you know, not at all. We, we had the show and that's part of the show. I wouldn't pull him, you know, his lead out. So um, he was strangling me. <laughs> that's fucking ridiculous. And one of our crew said, hey, Ingve, it was a Yugoslavian kid. He came a big guy and he came and got Ingve by the head put him under his arm like this. I said, you fucking touch him again. I will kill you right now. You know, <laughs> he stopped. And that night, as we were driving in the bus, that's when we fired Ingve because he was just ridiculous. I mean, trying to kill the singer <laughs> or something, <laughs> trying to ruin my voice, my throat, you know? So you don't, uh, you don't do that. Strangle the singer, no, 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 no. <laughs> Now, do you see Alcatraz as, as your band, or do you see it more like a collaborative band? How do you how do you see Alcatraz? Wasn't, yeah. uh, not much. I mean, basically, the the albums were me and the guitar player. When Steve Vai came along, it was me and the guitar player. That was the second album, uh, because the other guys weren't really songwriters. So it was always down to me and two people. It was down to two people: the soloists, you know, the guys that take the take the go at the front and do all the and the rest of it. So. Um, it was um, it was an experiment. The first album with Ingve, I, I didn't like the production on it, and I thought it wasn't as good as the second album with uh, Steve Vai, which I really love, and I I was very very into that album, and he was a much easier person to uh, work with, and he liked some of my ideas, and uh, the second album to me was was better, uh, production wise and song wise. But uh, people like the Ingve stuff because of who he was, who he is, you know, which I understand completely. But the guitar player was fa fantastic on that, but I didn't like some of the production of the voice and whatever, whatever else. The band sound itself wasn't that good. I don't think. I don't think, you know, but that's just me, you know. But that's why I like the second album better. Is it true that uh, Black Sabbath asked you to, to audition for the band? Uh, when Ronnie Dio yeah. left in 82? Or... Yeah, yeah, they called me up and uh, I said, I no. <laughs> I just said no. <laughs> um, I don't know if Cozy Powell was in Black Sabbath at that time, I can't remember. But uh, Cozy was getting around on every band in the world 
at the time, drumming and drumming and drumming. Um, yeah, I didn't think it was for me. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't fit with those guys with the mustaches and the, the leather jackets with the things hanging off. And I would look totally out of place. At least Rainbow had um, Don Airy, who was kind of smart, I guess. And uh, but, but that band was really leather and lots of leather. And I, I didn't particularly like their music, you know, but um, it, it's something that I, I sort of regret now because I know that Ronnie joined them and he did some great albums with them, you know. I would so, like to tell me about what's going on with the Graham Bonnet band, uh, you know, for 2023. What's going on with your solo, solo band right now? Well, we're waiting to go to Japan. Uh, we should be going there soon and getting a tour together. We we want to play. What we what we're doing now is like we're having a, a hiatus of such because we want to play better venues, and that's what our management has in store for us. You know, we've been out with the the, the Dead Daisies guy, which was great. That was fantastic in England and uh, Ireland, England and Ireland. We just did that tour. Uh, we were well well re received. It was like incredible, got great reviews, and which is incredible for me because I was really worried about the band sounding good after all these years of COVID, you know, and uh, Dead Days have been out there for a while and they were really tight, you know, and they were headlining. So we were supporting, but we got a, a great load, a lot of fans that night, the nights we played and um, really good reviews. I think I, I sang really good. <laughs> I was singing really well and the band was playing really well because, um, you know, we, we had to, we had to. You know, we've been off, off all that time. It's time to, um, you know, get back on, on the bike, so to speak. And it was good. We've had a great time. Last question here. Any advice for young singers out there? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Play the drums. Uh, well, uh, advice. Uh, well, what, myself, <clears throat> I never listened to so-called heavy rock singers. Now, one, one singer I really admire was uh, Little Richard, you know, from, from the old rock and roll 1950s days. He, he had such a fluid voice. He said, just the way he sang was so great. I loved him, but I could never sing like him. And uh, I think you should get your own style, you know, get your own style. Don't copy anyone um, if you can. And always, if you can, don't drink too much because that's what ruins your voice, uh, especially hard liquor. Uh, you know, whiskey and stuff. But uh, vocally, make sure your breathing's good, you know, because that's where you get your high notes, you're breathing really deep, you know, and that's where the high notes come from, not from here. Try not to do falsetto. I can't do falsetto to save my freaking life. But if falsetto is there, or head voice, head voice is that, and it's, um, oh, that's falsetto. Try it all. Um, but, um, it is mainly breathing. Um, keep your voice clean. And that's where the alcohol comes in. Don't eat before a, a, a gig or recording. Don't do that. Drink plenty of water, uh, which I do now, um, but not liquor, <laughs> which I used to do. Um, I, what else can I say? Uh, you'll know you've sung properly. I know I've sung properly when I come off the stage. And I, the back of my legs will ache, the bottom of my legs will ache, my butt will ache, and my shoulders. Because real singing, you use all those muscles. And it's unbelievable. After time off, as I realized, my God, I've just done low, low impact, uh, you know, aerobics, basically. That's what it is. Because your whole body is used. That's what I use everything to bit, get that, meh, that power, you know. So it, there's lots of things you can do, which I'm probably not saying. I know, and I don't know what else to say, but the things I have said, you know, I know what I did and what I do. And uh, before, as I said, before I sing a high note on stage, take a really deep breath, if you can. Snatch your breath, <gasps> and then go for it, you know. All right. I want to thank you, Graham, for coming on the show today. It was great talking to you. Oh, it's, likewise. I hope it made sense. <laughs>